Okay, so we are up and running. Uh, okay. It's a big pleasure to welcome uh, Richard Brower to uh, give today's uh, seminar. He's just from, <clears throat> virtually from Boston University, and he's going to tell us about quantum finite elements, lattice field theory, and curved manifolds. We're enthusiastic. Right. Yes, and thanks right. for taking time out from your Thanksgiving day. No, no, it's fine. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Um, actually, um, uh, well, I don't know where to start. I mean, uh, beginning to understand this problem, it's a hard problem from the uh, lattice point of view because you give up all the nice things of flat space and regular lattices and have to deal with a lot of um, technical details. Uh, it's interesting. I, I think it'll, I've been thinking more and more about it in geometrical terms, which actually goes back to Pascal in 1640, which I realize is um, only 20 years after the pilgrims came to the US. <laughs> which is Thanksgiving, so it's the same sort of error. Uh, actually, some of my relatives came on that uh, uh, boat, I'm told. So uh, uh, it's, it's um, I think, um, I'll, I'll just make a general thing. We're trying to figure out how to put uh, field theory on curved manifolds. There's many reasons for that, um, but more and more I've been dragged into realizing that you've got to understand geometry in a little bit deeper way than I've, I've understood in the past. So I will try to ex explain how the, the procedure goes. So, okay, so when you put something on a lattice, the standard thing here, this picture got here, is to put a um, it on a regular uh, cubic lattice, like the, the basis, this uh, checkerboard, right? And of course the advantage is, first of all, it's flat, and it's also true that it can be uniform squares, cubes, or whatever. So every point in the lattice is the same, which means that um, when you try to think about symmetries, you can always go to momentum space, and so you can do perturbation theory on a regular lattice, uh, much the way you would do normal perturbation theory with an uh, ultraviolet cutoff. And indeed, this is how Wilson and many people have thought about it. You can find, you can classify operators um, by their symmetries, you can, and their uh, dimensions, and give fairly rigorous arguments for why the when the cutoff goes to infinity, you should get a non-perturbative version of, of the field theory. All that gets much harder when you are on curved manifolds because you cannot introduce regular lattices. And so the objects that you, you want to and introduce is called simplex, the primitive, um, uh, here's a, a one-dimensional simplex, a line, a two-dimensional simplex is a triangle, a three-dimensional simplex is a, is a tetrahedron and the, the negative name of the next one is whatever it's called. And these are the simplest um, cells on which you can build any manifold. This is actually used in Reggie calculus to build uh, dynamical triangulation for gravity, but I'm not concerned with that. I'm, I'm trying to have a manifold which is not dynamical, it's fixed to which the field theory is uh, uh, attached. And uh, so it's really the study of these uh, simplicial lattices and how their symmetries uh, work with the symmetries you're trying to get out when you take the continuum limit. So that's the sort of general overview. Okay, so anyway, um, if you know, how can I, let me see if I can change it. Oh yeah, okay, so here's my outline. So first of all, uh, I'll give you um, a somewhat um, over-optimistic introduction that this shouldn't be possible. And then of course, um, that you gotta show that it is possible. And then the next thing I will show you is that the finite element method, which is a standard method, does in fact solve uh, free conformal field theory. Uh, and that's because basically a free theory is not a field theory in any um, dramatic form. It's really a solution to, uh, it's Gaussian, it's a solution to differential equations. And finite elements was invented precisely to do differential equations on any kind of manifold. Then the next thing I'll show you is this is um, a fool's paradise you have to worry about in, a, in an interacting theory, the problem of ultraviolet divergences. And we have two ways of dealing with this. One is um, by perturbative methods and the other is non-perturbative. And it's this last thing in green where we begin to understand that there may be a sort of general lattice. There may be a finite parameterization of the renormalization group uh, for this kind of curved lattices. I, I guess I can say it that way. And then later in the end, I will go back and say, maybe this works in general, but um, clearly uh, the proof is, is not there. 
the, the fact that we can do it in some special cases, and the special cases will not be surprisingly five four theory in the IC model, <laughs> the standard um, tests of, of new ideas. So that, that's the general outline. Okay. Now, uh, why did why do this? Well, there are a lot of problems in quantum field theory, particularly com, uh, uh, conformal field theory, where uh, it is common to put the theory on a curved manifold. In particular, there's something called radial quantization, which is a far better manifold to consider uh, a conformal field theory. And if you could do it numerically, we could really solve these problems. This is the um, uh, current um, computer, which is about to be replaced and we use for QCD. Um, this is a, a, a huge facility. And it's kind of sad that we can't do other field theories on this facility. Um, so um, that's the goal is, is to try to, to somehow manage to do this as um, efficiently as you would QCD uh, and be able to solve, I should say in Euclidean space, I'm not trying to solve the, the sign problem at this point. Um, but I, the question is, can you do essentially everything that you've done in flat space for a renormalizable field theory, can you do it in the curve space. So that's the, the grand hope. Um, here's my collaborators. I won't make a big deal about this, except for to say this is my student, Evan Owen, who's, which, whose stuff I will emphasize. And he's very bright, he's about to get through. George Fleming started with me on this. We have a, um, Anna, who's in, in uh, is, is off in Heidelberg University now. And this group of uh, my collaborators, Trini Tan, it's a small raggletag group. Anybody who wants to join it is welcome. Okay, uh, now we, we've made a series of calculations and the point what, that I'd like to say is that our goal, or I should say our goal, this is the grand goal. Our goal is that we should have any smooth manifold and we should be able to make a lattice uh, equivalent to it and take the continuum limit. Now, one uh, reassuring thing is that it is true it's not hard, to, it's hard to find this proven in generality in the literature, but it's quite clear that any renormalizable theory, that is to say perturbatively renormalizable theory, should be renormalizable on a smooth manifold. And the uh, argument is essentially, if your divergences are at short distances, they're ultraviolet, then as you go to the ultraviolet, any manifold starts to become close to the tangent plane, and you basically renormalize the theory on each tangent plane, putting in the proper um, factors of G mu nu to see how the tangent plane varies as you go across the surface. So it's fairly obvious that any renormalizable theory should be renormalizable on a smooth manifold. That is to say, there's no defects. It's just, just smooth curvature. Eventually you get a flat place on which to do your renormalization. That's that's pretty much it. So- Can I ask a Sorry. Can I- uh, yeah. yeah, this yeah, is yeah. Okay, uh, it, it is known in again in algebraic quantum field theory that the yeah. allowed states on the observables are yeah. what they call the Hadamard states. Well, okay. in Minkowski space, they don't change the metric or anything, and the Hadamard yeah. states is the property that at short distances it behaves yes. essentially like a free. Uh, it behaves like a free field. They prove okay. these states yeah, exist. Yeah, yeah. There is M. So in that yeah, case, the yeah. theorems by uh, uh, people doing uh, Lorentzian uh, hyperbolic manifolds like Dustermatt, uh, Heck, Dustermatt, and what is his name? Uh, in, uh, yeah, that uh, would be. Yeah, uh, show me. Show so me, it, show it is proof. Uh, so the show other things are no good. Yeah, so I, I have Bob, uh, Bob Bond has done this calculation for even for GR. Who was that? Who? Bob Bond uh, from Chicago. Oh, okay. Okay. Hey, and uh, one of his collaborators, they have actually done this calculation for curved uh, for matrix. I mean, the choice of the state so that the uh, uh, you can do a renormalization at short distance. You can do yeah, ultra right. renormalization. Of course. Right. I, mean, there, there, I mean, Hugh Osborne has papers on this, which basically says I do this example and it's clear it's going to work in general. So, I okay. mean, I, there's various methods. There's You can use a heat kernel approach. There's epsilon expansions and so on. But as I say, basically, um, it it's not difficult to imagine that this is true. But if you've got a papers which actually do this in greater detail, I'd like to see it. Um, okay. 
you, I, I'm content to do it in Euclidean space for this example, but you know, it's not really much difference than perturbation theory to go to Minkowski space. Uh, but it's anyway. not clear that Euclidean uh, formulation exists in these cases yeah. because yeah, of sure. restriction positivity. Sure, sure. Not That's always. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah, okay. So anyway, so okay, so so what are the curve space? I mean, so there's a general theorem that, that you uh, that probably says you should be able to do this in any manifold, but actually for interesting problems and also efficiency of computation, I'm not going to try to do every manifold, but there are several that are very interesting and they're basically um they're they're um um they're maximally symmetric spaces. They're uniform in, in every uh, place. So the, the manifolds of, of interest in this, uh, in my sense, is, is first of all, you can take a flat manifold in D dimensions and do a Riemann projection, and that turns it onto a sphere. The point, from the point of view of conformal field theory, this is a conformal or actually wild transform. And you can, you know, in conformal field theory that if you solve a conformal field theory in flat space, all of the data, all of the coupling constants and uh, dimensions are transferred one-to-one -one onto the curve manifold that give exactly the same amount of information. And in fact, you can take the solution. If you have an explicit solution in flat space, you can then transform it to a sphere and know all the amplitudes exactly. So that's, um, that's the, the spherical approach to um, conformal symmetry. In, in a sense, more interesting is what's called the radial approach where you take flat space and you take the radial coordinate, I guess I haven't written it down here, tau is equal to the log of r. And in this case, you're on a cylinder. This is the boundary of uh, global ADS space. And the advantage here is that the dilatation operator um, represents translations on this new radial coordinate. It's very efficient because um, Usually when you try to look at critical phenomena uh, in flat space, the problem is you're looking for a correlation length that's going to infinity, but the radial coordinate here is the log of the distance. So you, if you have logarithmically large lattice, you're getting, you're, you're approaching exponential distances. So this is um, known to be a much more efficient um, manifold uh, if you can do it. And then ADS space is another one, but all of these are, are very simple. So the actual technical approach is basically to figure out how to put lattices on spheres um, or on ADS space. I won't talk about ADS space very much, but it's very similar. So you don't, I'm not really trying to um, set up the machinery for all possible curve manifolds, um, although I think the ideas are general. So I, I okay. don't think uh, spheres higher than two dimensions are actually conformally flat. Yes, they are. It, it, it's it's it, it's a it's still a wild transform. I should check it, but it's it. That what you uh, yeah, sure it is sure it is. I mean it, it has the same form. Okay, I, I'll check. I don't it. know what you mean by conformally flat. It's not flat. It's curved. It's curved. It's a wild transform. It's that up to a wild transformation that it it's is. It's a wild transformation in any dimension. Okay. And, and so the cylinder is in any dimension. Certainly, yes. Well, if the cylinder is, then I will just uh, uh, go, I'll just squeeze this thing and I'll get to this. <laughs> I'll, go to, I'll dimensionally reduce it. No, it is true. Okay. If I'm wrong on that, then uh, you really should actually cancel my fee for giving this talk. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter anyway, it's not a big deal. No, no, no I mean, it does matter. These are these these are all conformally flat in your jargon. I I hate that word because they're of they're curved. So I don't know what I, I, I this whole business of talking of calling a wild transformation a conformal transformation is a confusing thing. It's not part of the conformal group. <laughs> no, it's um... you know <laughs> I think it's a terrible terminology. But anyway, okay. Anyway, the, these these are all conformally flat. Um, th this is um, actually uh, well hyperbolic space is a little bit different story. But I'm not going to emphasize that. Anyway, so look at now. Yes, this is I'm great to have a general of conformal rather than vial flat. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, so anyway, so it's great to have a general goal. But I I love this quote. I started to realize how much I should learn geometry. Um, and geometry, projective geometry, really comes to play in this uh, subject. I'm not going to be very formal about it. Um, 
And uh, projective geometry was in its heyday a couple of centuries ago. Apparently, if I was a, a student then, I would have learned a lot. Um, but I had to go learn it last summer to some extent. But I, I um, got onto Hilbert. And by the way, if you haven't seen this uh, book, it's wonderful. Hilbert has a little book called um, Geometry and the Imagination. Uh, it really is um, gets to the core of projective geometry without uh, undue formalism. But anyway, I love this quote. He has good quotes. And he says, the art of doing mathematics consists of finding special cases which contain all germs of generality. So I'm going to try to convince you, of course, you can be wrong, that if by looking at 543 and Ising model, we're beginning to learn lessons which are probably general for the general subject. So really, my talk is on the 543 and the Ising model. But I want to try to convince you that perhaps we're learning some general rules of, of greater insignificance. So anyway, so here, here's the, the phase plane of 54 theory. This was actually the question that, um, I, I have trouble with your first name, Denjoy, should I pronounce it that way? Is that good? Denjoy? Yes. Denjo. Denjo. Yeah. Okay. All right. So as, as, as was pointed out, the 54 theory um, has an infrared conformal fixed point, which is the same as the icing or C equals a half uh, minimal model. And so there's more than one way to get to um, a uh, single conformal field theory. The classic one is the icing model, which is has no ultraviolet extension. Or, uh, you, you don't see it. It's a lattice model, but you can also use 5-4 theory. And the point is that um, in 5-4 theory, you have an additional thing. You have the ultraviolet uh, fixed point and therefore you can talk about um, it being a real field theory, but it flows eventually in the infrared from, from here to here. And the uh, if you take the conformal limit, um, it's the same. Now in the lattice, what you do is the common thing, um, you can put either on the lattice, but if you do 5 4 on the lattice, the interesting thing about it is that this phase plane has two parameters. It has the relevant parameter, the mass, and then it has lambda. You can actually take lambda and fix it to any value that you want. You just scan in mu until you see the second order phase transition. And when you see the second order phase transition, you get the same answer. So every point on this curve, I know you can think of it in terms of flow, but actually in practice, you fix lambda, it just nailed. You take mu to the critical surface and you find the same answer. And indeed, the efficient thing to do on the lattice is actually to try to pick lambda to be close to the uh, fixed point, and then you're suppressing um, non-leading terms. But the interesting thing is you have to realize, what is this point? This lambda here on a lattice is dimensionless. And so the renormalized coupling, which is going to be this times um, um, a one over A, the lattice spacing, it's dimensionful. The renormalized coupling is going to infinity. So this is not a perturbated problem whatsoever. And in fact, it's, it's uh, from a lattice point of view, it's at infinitely coupling. It's far away from perturbation. This, this fixed point doesn't exist in perturbation theory, okay? It really goes off to infinity. And that's, um, so, um, now, so what the problem is that there's two, two approaches when you get to a curved manifold to try to come close to the uh, ultraviolet and figure out how to correct the cutoff effects from a perturbative example. And we've done that and it does work, um, but it means that you have to very sort of tune yourself into this um, uh, point here. Um, but we, what we've discovered now is a non-perturbative approach to, um, you might call them counter terms, um, in the IC model, which gets you directly to this point. So we have two ways to think about getting rid of the quantum effects, okay? And that's, I think, what I'd like to um, explain. Um, but anyway, this is our, our, our test case in both two and three dimensions. All right, so uh, at the Lagrangian level for the 5-4 five, five, theory, um, you know, this is the Lagrangian basically in curved coordinates. It's a classical uh, object. Um, you just uh, put in the right, right metric things. Actually, I've, I've left off a term, which I'll talk about. There should be a Ricci curvature term here. It's, it's over here in the lattice thing. So of course, when you put this thing on the lattice, um, what you expect to do is exchange derivatives with finite differences in some way. And, uh, and a set of points, x's, the x's and y's are sets of points. So you can do this uh, on a simplicial lattice. 
And what you're doing basically is you're using the fact that finite elements is a route toward the solution of differential equations. So when you've done this, what you're doing is you're managed to find a discretization, which gives you the classical equations of motion, okay? In particular, if you drop the, um, the five fourth term itself, set the mass to zero, what you're doing is finding the Lagrangian for the free conformal field theory. And in fact, you, you get the free conformal field theory, but you get it simply because it's really a study of differential equations. So let me uh, describe to you a little bit finite elements. It's some um, rather um, nifty uh, exercise. Okay. Oh, I should, I should say, um, uh, though I, I guess this, I should have had this earlier in my thing. Uh, this question of going to radial quantization was raised by Cardi uh, in 1985. And he realized that when you have radial quantization, of course, if it's in 2D, then the quote sphere is just a circle. So all you're really doing is standard cubic lattice, right? You have a, a, a you have a, a length of the cylinder, and then you can use equal spacing of points around us, uh, the circle, okay? So there is no problem with doing it in two dimensions. Radial quantization has been used a long time. It's very efficient. The problem happens when you go up one dimension. When you cut the cylinder, it becomes the Riemann sphere in, in uh, two dimensions. And then when you go one more dimension, it's the Riemann sphere in three dimensions. So. Uh, Cardi um, realized that this is a best, that is extremely good way to think about uh, conformal symmetry. And the, he, has, he has this warning at the end, I love it. Whether it's possible to use, to use numerical approaches for critical access opens uh, remains to be seen. He's basically saying, I don't know how to do it on a lattice. <laughs> good luck. And um, that's what we're trying to do. Um, actually, the first paper I wrote on this was reviewed and rejected. And I later, and then it was accepted later. And I discovered that Cardi was the one that rejected it. <laughs> Uh, it, it, we, we didn't solve the problem entirely. I guess that was his problem. Okay, so so let me let me describe the setup for radial quantization. Uh, okay, so here's the here's the cylinder. The length of the cylinder I said is really the um, is the log of the distance. That's called um, well call it t, t. But what it is is it's conjugate to the dilatation. So it's the what you get is exponential falloffs, just like you would on any um, mm -hmm. massive problem, except for now the exponents are uh, controlled by the, the dimensions of the operators. So you have a standard, what looks like a standard partial wave expansion. You have a, a cylinder, and then the cross section is a sphere. So it's not surprising that you get a, um, this is in three dimensions, that you get a standard partial wave expansion. This is just a uh, expansion of the conformal blocks. Um, if you look at a propagator, um, which in flat space, oh, there should be an equal sign here, sorry. In flat space is just a power behavior with this, with this, um, with this exponent. Uh, in this curved space, it turns out to be a cosh of the function along the cylinder and a cosine uh, of the, um, uh, on the other way, if you use a nice coordinate system, and the nice coordinate system is to put, uh, this is a two, two to two amplitude, you put two points on opposite sides of the sphere, and then you take the other two points and put an opposite sides of the sphere displaced by T, and then the invariant, the conformal invariants are nicely given by the distance between the two spheres, and the uh, angle is given by the the angle between this line and this line. So this is the exact propagator for two-point function in radial uh, coordinates, okay? Very, very nice. It's because you used a nice, um, uh, it, it's, of course, you can write these things for any points because of conformal invariance, but this is a nice thing. It's the center of mass coordinates, basically. Um, and then if you look at the free theory, of course, it's just a sum of propagators. So what you do in the free theory, you always divide by the um, incoming two-point functions. So the free theory is one, that's the S channel. Then there's the uh, propagator from X1 to X3 and, and X2 to X4, and then the um, cross terms. So there's a T channel and U channel. So, so, so this, is the, this is the free um, theory. It's, it's a non-trivial theory. And you, you know, usually you think of free theory as being uninteresting. 
but if you do it in terms of conformal blocks, it has all the conformal blocks uh, in, in all its glory. So, I mean, the free theory is actually a good test of your methods, um, although um, you don't have any ultraviolet problems. So that, that's the goal is to, is, to, is to study propagators in this form. So let me go now ask how you put this on a lattice. Oh, well, okay. Uh, I, well, maybe, okay. By the way, okay, so in two dimensions, here's, for example, using radial quantization to get the exponent. This is done on a laptop. On a laptop, you get this dimension, which is, should be um, one eighth um, immediately to many decimal places. I'm just trying to show that, that once you can do things in this coordinate system, you get extremely accurate answers. The real reason is, is that there is only one finite volume problem. The cylinder ought to be infinite if it's truly a wild transform but you can easily make the cylinder large. There's no problem with the sphere being finite because in fact it is finite, okay? So your manifold is a finite sphere and one long direction which you make long enough, okay? And that's much better than being on a torus where you have to make all of the directions of the torus large and the torus breaks conformal invariance. It's not a wild invariant thing. So I have not broken conformal invariance when the cylinder goes uh, to infinity. That's, that's advantage number one. Number two is exponential decays in that direction are exactly the dimensions, right? So it's clear that this, I mean, this is what Cardi says. It's clear this is the way we ought to be doing a numeric, okay? If we can do it. It's just far more powerful. We can get amplitudes and get, you immediately get extremely good results. Um, uh, so, okay, uh, that's the, and so here's, as I say, it's a little laptop calculation that my student did. And, and without any really serious effort, he got this thing to these decimal places. I mean, it's just easy in 2D, no problem. Okay, so now what's finite elements? Well, finite elements in 2D is the easiest thing to understand is replacing the manifold with triangles. And the triangles um, in general want to be as uniform as possible, but they don't have to be exactly uniform. In fact, they can't be. Um, and the, um, the, the geometry allows you to introduce um, the, either they either call finite elements or what's called discrete exterior calculus. You can do a discrete version of differential geometry on simplicial lattices, which it guarantees a lot of very nice properties. So, um, so there's two things that you have to do here. First of all, you, you represent the manifold, the metric tensor, as piecewise flat, that's the lowest approximation, which is completely adequate. So all these points here are points on the target manifold, but within the uh, triangle, it is the metric is, is flat. So in this form, it means that curvature is entirely um, concentrated at the points. And if you take parallel transport around these flat surfaces, you're here, you go flat, flat, no problem, flat, 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 you'll find that it's a deficit angle and you'll discover that you must have gone, there must be curvature around, okay? Then um, an important uh, feature of, of these um, lattices is that there's a dual lattice, which is uh, related, which, whose points are the circumcenters of the triangles. And with the lattice and the dual lattice, you can um, construct the and lattice analog of the star operator, the Hodge star operator. And this allows you to, to to get a um, discrete version of differential geometry. Uh, so then after you've got this manifold, then you, then you introduce the field. Now, interestingly enough, the field is introduced also as piecewise linear. So the field on top of a point, this is what's called an element, is, uh, has a value at each point. And then the interpolation of the field is given by flat surfaces to the adjacent um, uh, edges. So this is called an element. And so the, you, break, you take the continuum field and you put it in this basis. Then the easiest way to do it is you shove it into the Lagrangian, you do the integrals, and you get the discretization. That's the basic concept of, of um, linear elements. It turns out that, um, it took me a long time to realize this literature and, and finite elements I found a little um, far from clear. <laughs> uh, if you do this in two dimensions, Linear finite elements are exactly equivalent to the discrete exterior calculus. You do it in three dimensions, linear finite elements are not equivalent to discrete exterior calculus. And since I like the geometry of the discrete exterior calculus, I actually use the calculus itself to give the elements in higher dimensions. Okay. 
And so here's here's how it. Uh, okay, this is some um, more than the same, the same statement. Okay, so okay, so here's the. Um, so what is what, what you can think of is the element. Okay, I should say, how do you get this? I should go back. The way you get the finite elements with linear elements, you literally take the Lagrangian you had, you restrict the fields to this basis, you do the integrals, and you get the answer. So it's a means to a very good discretization, and because you've you've um, because your manifold becomes more and more accurate as the size of the elements are reduced, basically you can say basically that's the reason you get the right differential equations, you know? and and you can think of it as an integration procedure, which is just a generalization of the trapezoidal rule. In a trapezoidal rule, you can have one-dimensional elements. Well, by that I mean unequal lengths. And if you see what an, ang an element is, an element is a, um, is a they call them tent functions. The, the weight of this point is, is uh, linearly related to the two sides. If you add them up, you see this is a trapezoidal rule. So what this is, is an extension of the trapezoidal rule to triangles, okay? That's really what linear elements are. And then you can do it at every dimension. So it's a, it's a method of integration. Uh, and now, if you um, if you see what it does to the Laplacian, um, the Laplacian uh, turns into these are the lengths of the sides of the triangle. This is the area. You get this wonderful um, equation. Um, but as I say, you can also I don't know what the, why is this here. Oh shoot, it's, it's running. Do you does this get in your way? I guess it does a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure what you're trying to. Oh, this. Um, the little arrow there telling you to go yeah. backwards. Yeah. You can see it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Okay, anyway. Um, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, okay. when you just uh, if you want to get rid of it, it will go away in a few seconds. And if you space, well, if you use the space bar instead of the uh, of, uh, really? mouse, it, should, uh, it shouldn't reappear. Oh, there it is. Okay, so the point, oh, shoot. <laughs> You're right. Okay. All right. I won't touch anything. Yeah. So look, at uh, the point I want to make, it's, it's, this is very nice stuff and it, it's hard to um, do it quickly, but um, this formula, the first formula is what you get by integrating, shoving it into the Lagrangian and doing the integral. You, you can massage it and turn it into um, the inner, the form on the bottom, which is more intuitive. It's a uh, sum over in the right-hand side, a sum from i to j along the links, divided as you might expect by the length of the link squared to get a second derivative. And then the volume is the volume of the dual volume um, to the, uh, around the dual points. And actually you can do this cell by cell. In this, in this form, it generalizes the higher dimensions. And that is, um, uh, that is the discrete exterior calculus. You can, def you can def define forms on these structures. You can, this, this derivative is a, a discrete derivative. The star tells you how to go from the lattice to the dual lattice. Uh, and so you get a Hodge star, you get the, um, the standard uh, terminology of, of, of differential geometry. This generalizes um, to gauge theories. It generalizes to, um, Taylor Dirac fermions. Okay, it does. It takes some more um, imagination and and tweaking to do Dirac fermions. We've done it. It's not literally Dirac fermions. Don't themselves even in the continuum use a discrete exterior calculus. They're slightly unusual animals. They have to have a spin connection and so on. But all of this stuff can be done for all free theories. Okay, and the and the the beauty of it is that you can prove a lot of nice theorems. Uh, discreetly, and they will become the integral theorems of the continuum, okay? So on a classical level, this really such just solves the problem, and it's very cute. Um, the Stokes law is, is done. So anyway, I don't want to get you in the formalism. It's huge, hugely different notations, but just uh, I guarantee you this is a very nice uh, closed system, okay? And so finite elements are, are, are really ingenious this way. Um, okay, so now, um, uh, okay. And I'll, and I'll get into this geometry more. Now, so what do we do for the sphere, just as a, a mechanical thing? The um, farthest you can go with regular triangles to 
to uh, approximate a sphere is called the icosahedron. Um, then what we do is we take the uh, surfaces of the, um, of the triangles and we break them up into equilateral triangles. But of course, that's not a sphere. We then project them onto the sphere and then you get um, this more uh, uh, regular looking thing. But you should realize that these triangles cannot all be equilateral. If there were, there would be a uh, platonic solid <laughs> with more triangles, right? And in fact, of course, there had to be um, 12 uh, special points which have only uh, five triangles meeting and all the rest have six triangles. That's um, a theorem. Uh, but it's useful to do this because we maintain precisely the uh, icosahedral group, which means that some of our, our group theory at the low levels is exact. And um, we can check our, our equation for that. It's always good to have as much symmetry as possible, but you cannot get any a larger uh, symmetry than that uh, as a subgroup of O3. Um, uh, and, um, Okay, so that's the problem. Okay, so now at the classical level, this discrete exterior calculus, a Laplace operator, here's what you would get if you didn't use these wonderful weights for the spectrum. This is the singlet, the triplet, and the, the five things. These are protected by a costahedral symmetry, but then you start getting terrible uh, splitting. This should all be one level and so on. With finite elements, this is the spectrum you get. This is just showing that the free theory is correctly modeled by finite elements, okay? So it, it does a perfect job um, up, up to the cutoff, <laughs> far from the cutoff, for the differential operators, okay? Or for the free theory. Um, now, the problem is that's not the end of the story. What about interactions? If you start throwing in a phi four theory and you, you still tune, um, you, you tune uh, to the, um, the best you can, to the critical point. And if you look at the value of phi squared on the sphere, this is one configuration, but if you look at the average value on the sphere, you discover phi squared is by no means uh, spherical. This should be, um, you know, by the way, this is now reducing it to a two-dimensional problem. It's, it's, it's fine, I'm really just looking at the sphere, okay? And um, so the average phi squared of your configurations look like this. And this is just saying that the, uh, triangles at the poles are less um, dilated. And so they have a smaller lattice spacing or larger cutoff in the ultraviolet than the triangles uh, in the surfaces. And therefore the thing is not finding a single critical point. You cannot tune a single parameter, the mass and get to the critical surface. There is no critical surface. There is a mixed phase. And that is the price you pay uh, for having an irregular lattice and the price you didn't have to pay when you were on the cubic lattice, okay? And it, it's, it's a, it's so in, not, in other ways they say it, there, there appear to be other revel, relevant parameters. In fact, the disaster um, would be that there's an infinite number of rele relevant parameters that I have to tune and then I really fail. I mean, you know, that's not a theory. If I have to have an infinite number of parameters <laughs> to, to get to the continuum limit, I'm, so our argument, our argument is that that's not the case, um, but it, it's a fear. In fact, uh, my friend Uvi Visa told me that I was crazy to do this because I would fail. Of course, that was good incentive to continue. Um, so anyway, but you, you, can, you can ask what's happening. And what's happening here is that when you calculate this, you're really uh, doing a one loop diagram. And that one loop diagram has a uh, ultraviolet divergence. So it knows about the cutoff locally. And if you look at this, um, you, you calculate the lattice version of that one loop diagram, you discover this is literally the operator that we get from the discrete theory calculus. We invert it to calculate the loop diagram. Then we find the logarithmic divergence. This is the universal divergence of the continuum theory, but the, um, and this is an infrared cutoff. What you find is that the log is being shifted by the relative size of the lattice spacing. Now, fortunately, you can of course multiply and divide by a uniform lattice spacing. The divergent part is universal. Uh, it, would be, it would be disastrous if I had to uh, add an infinite term to the Lagrangian, but the change in this uh, divergence is only this, and this is a finite number. It's the size of the, it's sort of the mean size of the lattice spacing relative to the lattice spacing that I got by, by blowing it up. 
And this is, you know, sort of like, I don't know, 30% effect, but this is a finite term. I, I don't want to get rid of this term. This is the correct term for renormalized perturbation theory. But what I do is I add this term or subtract this term to cancel it in the finite element Lagrangian. And that's why we call it a quantum finite elements. There's quantum corrections to the discretization of the Lagrangian in order to have it be a correct quantum theory, okay? So finite elements were invented correctly for differential equations. They solve the free conformal theory, uh, although that wasn't the way they usually stated it. You need a correction like this of order lambda in this is two dimensions. Uh, and since it's super renormalizable, this is the only divergent ultraviolet sensitive diagram in two dimensions. Um, and uh, when you do this, you now have a uniform cutoff scheme in the renormalized theory, in the renormalized perturbation theory, okay? And you then should get, you should get exactly the same perturbation theory on this uh, lattice as you take the uniformly the lattice spacing to zero, okay? So that is what we tested and uh, it works. Here's, here's, here's the two dimensional problem just on a sphere. I'm now going to the Riemann sphere itself and not the cylinder, okay? And you calculate answers doing Monte Carlo. This is very nice. You can use cluster algorithms, which are extremely efficient. Uh, this is the central charge, which should be a half. Uh, this is the coupling of the sigma sigma epsilon coupling, which should be a quarter. This is the um, uh, anomalous dimension of the energy term, which is to be one. Uh, where is this? I don't see the other anomalous dimension. Where is it? Anyway, it should be there. Um, uh, and, and so on. And uh, so, so look, so it works and um, we're, we're fairly confident it's correct. Okay. Now, you can also, by the way, yes, hello? You have a column norm here. What does that mean? Um, I'm trying to figure it out myself as well. <laughs> Such a long time ago. Um, that's a good question. I love to find out. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, th this was the range in which we were uh, measuring the correlation functions. Uh, th this is the size of the lattice. By the way, look at the, the lattice. The largest lattice was um, 36 squared by, um, this is the, this is wrong. This should be a two. It, it's basically um, 10 times 36 squared was the number of points on the sphere. Um, you know, I, I don't know what this is. I, I have to go back to the paper if I don't why we put it. It doesn't matter. I, I don't, it doesn't matter, but I don't know what it is. Um, but, but let me say one of the things about, oh, okay, one interesting thing about the sphere. Now we have no finite volume effects. The sphere is what we're saying. There is no image charges. There's no wraparound. The full theory is on a sphere, which is exactly the space in which we want to solve it. So for a lot of uh, pe people, this comes as a surprise. We can write any interesting field theory at all without a finite volume effect. And it's because you mapped it to the sphere and the radius of the sphere sets an infrared volume. Normally you would say this is terrible, but in a conformal field theory, you lose no information by doing that. That's the magic of the wild transform. So there is no finite volume effect. The only effect is the lattice spacing. Now on the cylinder, it's almost as good as that, except for the cylinder should be infinitely long. So it, it, it does away in conformal field theory with um, a large source of errors. And, and, and you can get, in principle, once this works, we can get answers in Monte Carlo conformal field theory that'll be much more accurate than they've been gotten in principle. We'll see. Can I, okay, so can now- I ask, Can I ask a question? Um, on a yes, two scale, yes. there is an Euler characteristic, which is two. And yeah. I have heard in the Thomson problem that because of it, there is no simplicial decomposition of the two sphere, which is rotationally invariant. That's right. That's right. That's right. We don't have perfect rotational invariance. What I'm claiming is that it, we, we gain it as the spacing goes to zero. You just have a finite subgroup of the... Uh, uh, of all. Well, well, we have the icosahedral group with reflections, 120 elements. 
No, we're not claiming that we, we've solved a problem that can't be solved. We're claiming that as the lattice spacing goes to zero with the renormalized coupling lambda, that we get the full set. Look, on the cubic lattice, the same thing. Cubic lattice, you only have rotations by 90 degrees. The claim is because that there's a finite set of relevant parameters for which you get the continuum limit of the field theory. I mean, lattice theory is, is, is exact if it's, if it's really serious or it's wrong, <laughs> okay? Okay, can you ask, when I said rotation, I mean some discrete subgroup of SO3. Um, all well, the, the, largest one is, the, largest one, the largest one is the icosahedron. Yes, from my understanding, for example, there are people who try to solve putting n equal charges on a two sphere, and one does not know what is the ground state because the regular placement of the charges is impossible on a two sphere. This is a Thompson yeah. problem. So that suggests that. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're talking, is, it, is this a continuum question you're asking? No, no. You put n charges on it. Yeah. I suppose yeah. it is a continuous question. You put n charges on a two sphere with Coulomb interactions, equal charges, and one would imagine that they can be regular, they will get regularly placed. But that is impossible because of the Euler characteristic. Okay. So there are papers by, uh, I think, many people. This is called the Thompson problem. Yeah. And uh, well, I, I think um, I, I think uh, I think he's wrong. I mean, I I know how to do the Coulomb problem on a sphere. Yes. Okay. I, I th this is this is. I mean, I'll tell you, finite elements are, are very strange. The way I mean, generally, what finite elements do when they have a charge is they. Um, they cut out the space in which the charge is and replace it with a boundary condition, okay? It turns out that um, this counter term that I'm discussing is actually the way to do it, <laughs> okay? Uh, I, I think we are actually slightly improving finite element methods, even classical ones. So can you apply it to the Thomson problem? And solve it. You have to show me. You have to show me the. You have to send me the Thompson problem. So make I, I sure think that the I. Thompson problem bothers essentially the same as he said. He has to pick twelve special points of in to uh, where the triangles no, but, are different. No, no. I, I, I grant that you can never do it at finite uh, lattice spacing. The question is, can I get the solution as the lattice spacing goes to zero? I mean, of course we can't do it. We never can do anything exact that was finite lattice spacing on any lattice. I mean, it's not unique to the sphere. I, anyway, I don't know the problem as you as you pose it. So unless you send it to me, I can only speculate that I think it's not a problem. But that's my opinion. Not, not, not that's nothing to be taken seriously unless I look at it. Okay. I, I don't know the problem as you've stated. So okay. I, I, you should send it to me. I mean, I really will look at it because I'm I'm I know the issue you're talking about, and I think it's a serious issue. Um, I believe that we know how to do the Coulomb problem on a sphere, but it's it's a serious question. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing it. I, I just don't know where the problem is. So I mean, yes, we have to take the limit. The question system. is whether the limit exists, right? It's not a question of whether you can do it on a finite sphere, on a finite tessellation. Of course you can't. I can't do a point to charge on a... Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just noting that I should send you the reference. Yeah, send it to me. No, I mean, it's obviously a serious question and I'm, 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 I should say I don't know the answer because I didn't even know the question. <laughs> it's, it's hard to okay. answer, answer a question that I don't know the question. No, it may, maybe there's some technical thing. It is of interest. I know, well, okay, we'll, we'll discuss it. Um, I, I, um, Well, I can. You know, we have a sort of renormalization group approach to the putting in charges. So I think maybe we have a different approach, whether it solves a problem or not. I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. Anyway, look, the point is that on, on the sphere, um, you can do uh, four point functions. This is the actual, the whole four point function in, in a plot. So you can get um, a lot of information once you, once you put things on compact manifolds. That's all. That's my, my whole story. Um, so, um, and everything, of course, is known exactly for the two point, the, the, the two dimensional uh, IC model, so you can do a lot of comparisons. Okay, so now uh, uh, let me continue so now. You mentioned your, your uh, mu eyes that shift. 
Yeah. And I restrict myself to just um, a small number of those being distinct. I should be, I'm thinking that if I start refining with the icosahedral symmetry, I have visit 12 points that are special. So I might expect to be able to. to no, 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 they're, they're all different. See, every, the triangles are, are the triangles are, have to be um, projected onto the plane. I'll discuss this now, okay? But um, I think I'll, I want to discuss exactly this issue, but all the try look at, you can mod out 120, okay? But other than that, they're all distinct. Okay, all right, we'll see. All right, okay, thanks. All right, I'll, I'll, I can, let, let me show you this. Okay, here, here this will, because uh, this is a cartoon, let me see. Okay, yeah, this is a cartoon. Suppose that, um, suppose that this uh, surface here is this, is one of the planes of the flat triangles in the icosahedron, okay? Now, what we've done is we've put equilateral triangles on that flat plane, and then we've projected them from the center of the circle onto a tangent plane, okay? So uh, what you get is the triangle itself gets um, uh, stretched along the axis that, it, uh, um, that it's bent, okay? And so uh, if, you, if you start with an equilateral triangle here, what you get, well, I want to really do projective geometry. I want to take um, the triangles to, to zero so they, they're right at the transit point. Um, it, what you find is that the triangle has been uh, affine uh, stretched, okay? So it's actually exactly an affine transformation on the tangent plane, okay? Uh, so, um, so what happens in an affine transformation is that um, a, um, what used to be a, uh, a spherical propagator from some point zero to any point X, this is the correct uh, geometry of the propagator from uh, uh, some point, arbitrary point to, an, to another point, X and Y. What happens is that this propagator gets stretched, okay? And this is an affine transformation. An affine transformation is, um, it's a kind of interesting in two dimensions. Uh, the Poincare transformations is two translations and one rotation, three, three variables, right? An affine transformation is exactly doubles that, okay? And the affine transformation in two dimensions is the ability to take the circle and stretch it into an ellipse with uh, different um, major and minor axes, okay? and oriented, that's two of them. And a third one, which is the size of the ellipse, which is scaling. So the affine transformation includes scaling. The conformal transformation takes the Poincare transformations, a ro two ro one rotation, two translations, adds scaling and two special transformations. So actually in two dimensions, it's kind of interesting. The affine extends to the Poincare group as three plus three, and the conformal transformation extends the group to three plus three. They have in common scaling, but they do not have in common the other two. And a conformal transformation uh, preserves angles, right? And an affine transformation doesn't. And a conformal transformation preserves circles, <laughs> circles to circles, and an affine transformation doesn't. So one way to say, I think this is slightly, hand waving, but one say, way to say the problem is that we have a tessellation rule which gives you affine changes, but we want to keep conformal transformations. And, and they're fighting each other, okay? So what we found out is that by thinking about this problem carefully, um, we have found a way to do the icy model on the sphere. The discrete icing model on the sphere by in, in a sense correcting the affine space at each point uh, uh, on the tangent plane. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, and this is, this is my hope that this is more general, so I'll say this and then I'll show you how it works. My hope is that whenever you have a flat surface which, um, uh, on which you can solve uh, uh, field theory, 
because it has translational invariance, that that surface gets an affine transformation to the tangent plane. And while it's true that you have to adjust locally constants, it's not an infinite number of constants. You have to enjoy, adjust only the affine uh, transformation constants. So this is, a, this is a kind of analog of having a finite number of relevant variables, but they're position dependent. Now, that's not an impossible problem to think of solving. Okay, and we solved it in one case in the IC model because we can we solve it because the theory is known, okay? But my hope is that this is a general statement that you that anytime you have a flat plane, and if you do it carefully enough and project it onto a tangent plane by an affine transformation, that that's general enough to say that there's a finite parameter space to get the non-perturbative corrections to the theory. Now, that's a huge, um, of course, uh, speculation. I, mean, I couldn't agree more. If you say, say this is uh, crazy, you are probably in good company. Uh, but at least we have one example of that. So I think we're beginning to have what I consider to be a strategy. Um, this, the, the, the affine transformation is rather amusing. Um, the affine transformation exactly doubles the Poincaré group. So, uh, and by the way, let me go back to finite elements because this is really the issue. Why is finite elements, um, why do they know about affine transformations? And I'll tell you why. I'll go back to the original picture. Look, look what a primitive simplex is. Uh, let's do it two dimensions. A simplex is uh, an object which, whose geometry is defined by three edges, the length of those three edges. Those three edges are exactly the affine transformation parameters. You, in other words, if you take an equilateral triangle, Oh, this is my, <laughs> my brother-in-law's cars. I hope you have. If you take an equilateral triangle and you do an affine transformation, you get the most general triangle mod rotations and translations. In other words, if you're Euclid, right? <laughs> Euclid, I, I, I think this is a sort of exercise. I ask the question, how many triangles are there? If you're Descartes, you say, I have two points two variables for each point. And you say, I have six parameters. So a triangle in Descartes in a coordinate system is six parameters, two, two points for each thing. That's the six parameter triangle. If, if you're Euclid, you say, oh, I'm smart. I, I do Poincaré invariance. I consider the triangle to be rotated and translated to be the same triangle. And you're left with three. Those are the affine transformations. If you're smarter and Euclid was smarter, he says, I'll do scale invariance and I'll call them similarities. And he says, oh, I only have two. Those are the angles, okay? Now, this generalizes for simplices. So if you ask, so in other words, there's only one simplex mod affine. And in fact, the, the finite element people use this uh, knowledge. The same thing is true for a tetrahedron. There's only one tetrahedron mod affine transformations. And the additional affine transformations are exactly the six lengths of the edges. So every simplex is geometry is entirely known from its lengths of its edges. And that additional information is exactly the extension of the Poincaré group. Okay? So this whole discrete, um, this took me five years to finally get it through my head that this is what finite element people are often doing, okay? In fact, they often get the element weights by doing an affine transformation to a regular thing, and then they find the weights which are trivial, and then they go back and, and, and find them the other way, okay? So there is only one simplex mod affine, okay? So in a projective geometry sense, there are different simplices, okay? Uh, and, and by the way, the projective geometry for the affine transformation is very different from the conformal projective geometry, right? Uh, which is uh, in, in two dimensions, it's uh, CP1 is the conformal uh, uh, projection. So anyway, uh, the information on the metric is, in, this is the reason they're used for Reggie calculus, okay? The metric information uh, sometimes they even throw, throw that away, but okay, in an ensemble. But the metric information is entirely in the edges. They're rigid, that's it. And so I think this may be general in higher dimensions. That's my hope. 
So anyway, so how do we do this uh, for the icing model? And that, and this is a lot of math, which I won't, I'll just ski, give you schematics on it. But the fact that we can do it for the icing model. So, so, so what we want to do is we want to adjust, we want to adjust the metric so that we turn this ellipse back into a circle. And we do this in two steps. This took me recently, I just understood this from my student. In two steps, we can use the affine transformations of orientation to say set B equal to zero and A equal to C. We still don't have the unit normal. In order to get the unit normal, we need to use scale transformation. In other words, there are three transformations to get it back to the right thing. So the full affine transformations are, can undo the error of the lattice, okay? So how do we do this? Well, you can do, for the IC model, you can do this because of a wonderful um, uh, Kramer-Warmer duality between tri triangular lattices and hexagonal lattices, okay? So you can write the icing model down in a triangular lattice. This is a triangular lattice, or on a hexagonal lattice, and the and now you introduce again three parameters, and these three parameters turn out to be the affine <laughs> parameters. Okay, again, I mean in, in disguise. So what you can do is first of all you can show this is exact. Okay, well, I'll give you the answer. Okay, the answer is the following: the um, correct. See what what happens is the following. When you write, okay, this is, when I write down an icing model, I am not saying anything about the geometry. I am writing down a graph with coupling constants. Geometry is what you get when you go to critical point and ask how the correlators fall off. So when, when I write down to say this, this say triangular lattice, I do not know what the geometry is. I do not what, know what the lengths of the bonds are. This is, this is really important. It's, it's a funny distinction, but it's an extremely important one. This is a graph. It is not a, uh, a Riemann surface. This is a point that is always emphasized by Michael Fisher as well. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm good company. <laughs> no, this is not new point. It was only new to get it through my thick head. <laughs> okay. And how, how important it was to make this distinction. The trouble is that we're so used to regular lattices where we know the answer uh, that we kind of forget that we have to find out the answer. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the question is, given these parameters K, what is the geometry that you get? Uh, clearly, if you... Um, if you think of these things as unit lengths, what happens is you discover that all your correlations are on ellipses. And so that what you need to do is to find out the lengths of these bonds that corresponds to bringing them back to the right metric. You need to undo the mistake you just made, okay? And the answer is quite interesting. Uh, first of all, a critical point on the triangular lattice is, is given by this beautiful equation. I, do, I never see this written quite this way in the literature, although obviously if people know this, uh, but they have more complicated equations. It's rather interesting because these are actually the pro probabilities of percolations. If, if uh, anybody knows what a percolation algorithm is in a, in, a, uh, in a lattice. And the relationship between the couplings and the lengths which restore the spherical symmetry is th th this is the length of the triangle and this is the length of the, dis the perpendicular distance to the dual lattice, it's this ratio, okay? So this is the rule which gives a metric definition to the graph, which is the correct conformal theory, okay? And interestingly enough, if I look at the free theory, this is the relationship which I got from discrete exterior calculus. Similar, but not the same. This is the ultraviolet fixed point, and this is the infrared fixed point. Now, the interesting thing is that there's a one-to-one -one relation, that there's a parameter space that flows from the ultraviolet to the infrared. And so this is my statement that there might be within, now this is all flat, by the way, and uniform. I'm just doing the tangent plane, right? So I'd still have translation invariance, so I have no, no problem. My point is that I that we now do this on every tangent plane by understanding the affine transformation. 
And in this case, since we know the answer, we can use it, okay? <laughs> we don't have to find it, we just use it. How do we know the answer? Well, the answer, by the way, this goes back to um, your, your comment uh, uh, in the beginning that the icing model is kind of a free theory. It turns out that because it's a free theory, uh, we can map, uh, this was done, it's sort of generalization of a nice paper by Uli Wolf, um, but we can take the um, icing model on the triangular lattice and map it into uh, uh, wild fermions. And then since the fermionic representation is the free theory, <laughs> that has a finite element uh, solution. And then we can go back and find out the geometry of the original uh, icing lattice. So it's a whole bunch of uh, fun uh, stuff. It actually has a lot of um, projective geometries lurking under the thing. It turns out that the general, if you, if you apply arbitrary lengths, one, two, three to the uh, triangular lattice, then, you, then because of the shape, it turns into an ellipse. And then the affine transformation takes us back to a circle. And as I say, this is very much in the spirit of Pascal and, uh, and ancients uh, in projective geometry, all kinds of beautiful theorems, actually very limited cases. Um, and uh, so you can go back and see things from 1640. I was mentioning this is almost the same as when Thanksgiving uh, celebrations come, it's 1620, I believe. <laughs> okay. So anyway, there's a nice geometry to find this map. It took us a while to understand it, but it's really rather trivial. Now, what, what, what can we do with this? Well, we can show that this works by doing one new problem. We can, uh, new to us, not new to the world, uh, we can take a, uh, a general toroidal lattice. Now, if you have a toroidal lattice with a, um, a modular tilt to it, so that the, um, the angles are no longer um, 40, uh, 90 degrees. So this is a lattice for torus with a modular parameter uh, sitting somewhere here. And you see, the way to tile this thing is to use these affine uh, distorted uh, triangles. So now we can do the finite, the conformal field theory on the finite torus, which is exists. Like it's given in terms of the Jacobi functions. We do the computation, we get the basically up to machine, uh, up to accuracy of our calculations. We get the right part, the two point function for this thing. So it does show that you can use um, the, the um, in other words, the modular transformation is also an affine transformation. Okay, um, and so the general the general torus is an affine uh, translation of the um, well, actually, it's it's uh, of the square lattice. But in, all of these lattices are just aff are related by affine translations. So um, that's one way to think about the modular parameter for the icing model. It works. Now we um, we decided to see whether we this could occur. So now we go back to the IC model on the sphere. And on each point of the sphere, we calculate on the tangent plane, the new shape of the triangles. Then we adjust the parameters on that sphere by this relationship that we've gotten in flat space. It's a function of position, but it's a known function of position, right? We put that in there and then we actually, um, when we do that, what we've done is we've turned the um, ellipses into circles. However, that's used only two of the affine parameters. We then also have to make sure that the size of these uh, circles or the size of the lattice spacing is constant. And so we also adjust the uh, positions of the triangles to make the dual areas the same. And then when we do that, we discover that indeed, uh, we have a test of, of, of of um, the breaking of the spherical symmetry. So this is the first uh, level in the icosahedral group in which the, um, this is the L and M quantum number, in which the M quantum number is not, um, it's not a, um, it's not a sevenfold uh, uh, state. It's broken up into two irreducible representations under the icosahedral group. So this quantity here should be zero if spherical symmetry is restored. And here's the, um, Here's the, the affine, the two parameter affine transformation, which is turning it into circles, but not turning the size uniformly. When we use all three affine transformations, here is the breaking term. We've, we've made more checks than this, but you see the breaking is clearly um, much better. Whether it's perfect, we don't know, but I think it is. 
So what's happening is that, that um, by virtue of using all of the affine parameters to retune locally the triangulation, well, the constants in the triangulation, um, we believe that we now have the exact approach to the icing model on the sphere. Now, it's gonna be hard to reproduce this, of course, in other conformal theories, because we do not have the analytic relationship to this parameter space. But the question that we're raising, um, which is just a speculation, is it however true that this is the parameter space that you have to work in? Is it gonna be always true that we only have to look at this affine parameter space, which it grows by the way, of course, it, in the three dimensions, it'll be six parameters, the number of edges on the, on a tetrahedron. Um, and so we, 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 can, we can, I think, eventually get algorithms to test whether this is in fact what's happening. Um, who knows? But it's, so now to go back, um, just to go back uh, a little bit to our original problem. Uh, so that, that's the non-perturbative approach, which is very new. And certainly we don't know what the next step is. But to go back to the perturbative approach, which is not wrong, it's not wrong to use the counter terms. Uh, it's that you need to now have a field theory which you can get close to the renormalized ultraviolet um, limit, okay? And so just to show you that that does work, here's again the, um, uh, the radial quantization going to three dimensions, which is R cross the sphere. Uh, if, you, um, if you don't dilate it at all, you get a critical theory. This is the binder accumulant. You get a critical theory, but it's the critical theory on an icosahedron, <laughs> okay? It's not the critical theory on a, on, a, on a sphere. If you use finite elements, this is sort of repeating, and you do nothing but finite elements, then you find because of the interaction, you, a critical point means that you, you tune the mass parameter so that you are neither in the ordered or disordered phase. And so the critical point for the Vinda cumulant is to try to find a value of the mass parameter that goes directly to the surface. And you can see you, 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 you look like you, you can tune it this way. Here, it looks like it's impossible. When you add the counter terms, then you find again that you can get to the critical surface. So this apparently works. Um, it, um, and I'm gonna show you that we still have some questions. Um, this is um, again, uh, restoring spherical symmetry. In three dimensions, there's two ultraviolet diagrams. You have to do the one loop diagram and the two loop diagram. This is the logarithmic diagram. We do them much in the same spirit. Um, here is the um, calculation of the, there is actually one rather interesting twist here, which we ignored at first. Uh, when you look at the, um, the uh, exponent of the, um, of, the, of the odd term, the first data that we took uh, were, were these red points. And it turns out that we left off this Ricci curvature, scalar curvature term. Now, it is actually true that this term here, after you tune the critical mass to the surface, the remaining, the, 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 the trouble is that in, the, in a constant curvature space, the Ricci term looks like a mass term. So you have to decide what you mean by it. And our definition of it is what remains after we tune the mass to the critical surface. It turns out that when that happens, this becomes subdominant, but so it's not actually necessary. There's, you don't need two parameters because on a constant curvature surface, you can't tell the difference between a scalar curvature term and a, um, and a mass term. But it turns out that because of the scaling property of, of phi squared, it's, um, its behavior is uh, almost like the square root of the couple of the lattice spacing, but a square root is too slow. And the trouble is that if you take the derivative of the square root, you get one over the square root. So the actual approach, if you, if you leave this off, you have a curve that is trying to go tangent to this point, which is a heck of a hard way to find the limit, right? So what we discovered is that if we concluded this term, actually we did it perturbatively at first, what happens instead of having these red dots, we have these blue dots. And therefore they, it's not hard to see that they get a reasonable answer. 
it turns out that it overshoots by a little bit. And so we've now computed the perturbative correction. This is the Ricci term uh, for the free theory. We've now computed the perturbative correction to the Ricci term, which is actually curing this overshoot and is coming down to here, okay? So while it is technically irrelevant, it is actually extremely useful <laughs> to understand it, okay? So this is again, yes? This, this is a, when you say the correction to it, it is a lattice correction. Is that what it is? No, no, we, I mean, the, the, the Ricci term, I know, I know the Ricci term, I mean, and the one quarter or one eighth is the conformal factor. I, I think that yeah, you should have but that's for the free theory. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I, I had a discussion a little bit with Hugh Osborne about this, which I never got to it. I asked him, was there corrections? He said, that's interesting. I'm not sure, but there probably are. And then I looked into it, and there certainly are corrections to the Ricci curvature term due to non perturbative effects. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. There, there's actually, uh, there is one, I mean, I, I found it very hard, okay, to find again this in the literature. There is one paper that does this in hyperbolic space. Yes. Um, which has a cal calculation, which I think is correct. I mean, I know that the, uh, that, that term, uh, that uh, you've written it as one quarter there, that's often written as XE. That, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, that's the that's runs, the standard. Something value. runs, but it's supposed to have a fixed point at at one quarter. So yeah, but that I think that's only the ultraviolet. I I think it's some, um, you okay. know. That's interesting. I'm looking into I, it. Yeah. I, okay. Very interesting. No, no. no I'm, I'm I'm glad to have you 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 question this because it took me a long time to think there was a correction. I think we now know how to compute it, but it is really it's funny. It's a kind of um. The way it's computed uh, in in order lambda is by using a um, it's a kind of funny calculation. It's more like background field calculation. You write down the equations of motion and solve a nonlinear set of equations of motion to get that one loop correction. And that's not actually easy to generalize the two loops, which we would like to do. Okay. And and as I say, well, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think it's a question which is not. I can't find a, a really decisive uh, calculation. So, on Richard, it. did you say there are non-perturbative effects in this you run? What? Did you say there are non-perturbative effects that make the yes the coupling on? Yes. But what 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 are the non-perturbative yes. effects here? Sorry, um, the, the, the Ricci term, there is a standard Ricci term for the free theory, right? It's this C function. It's yes. uh, a D minus two over D plus one or something. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh -huh. uh, and um, that's what we put in here. But uh, that is true. I, look, I, I know how to calculate. I know how to derive this without um, any, any effort. If you just look at the free theory and you take the free theory on a plane, which of course has no curvature term, and you do exactly the calculation which is projecting onto the cylinder, you'll find the Ricci term. You mm -hmm, don't have yes. to talk about you know, any kind of relativity, right? It's simply a, it's a consequence of the wild transformation. So there's no question that in the free theory, you get that. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Right now, the, I think in the interacting theory, it's not. It, it has contributions. And as I said, I talked to Hugh Osborne, but I didn't. You know, I'm at a distance. I need to get back to him. And at first, he said, "Well, I don't know." And then he then he thought about it, and I I respect his knowledge, <laughs> but I'm not saying this is a proof. He said, "Yes, I think there is a correction." And I do find I did find a paper that does this in hyperbolic space. I can forward it to you. I think it looks correct to me. Um, it does the first order correction. And we do basically the same calculation in this uh, um, spherical space. Uh, I actually don't know how to generalize that argument to the second order because it's not done from Feynman diagrams. It's done from equations of motion and sort of effective terms. And it's a very clever method, but it's not um, easy to generalize. It's kind of a mean field like method. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't actually have a good calculation of it. So, um, uh, but, um, but I think the first order is there, and I think we actually see it in the data, so it makes me uh, 
optimistic that there's good argument. I mean, by the way, this, this, this project with my student has been a really wonderful case of, of us making theoretical mistakes, which the uh, numerics has taught us to uh, not make. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's a case where, you, um, you know, well, yeah, but you know, people, you know, say, you know, the, 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 the reason for numerical methods is not numbers, but insight. And I think this has really been a good example of that. This is my dog. Zoe, stop it. My dog thinks it should guard the house. Come on. See, you can, I, I, you can join the Zoom calculation, but you, okay, anyway. So I believe there is a, a, a theory, uh, um, a, a perturbated thing. I think we calculated it, we see it in the data, but I'm not satisfied with the argument. I, 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 and I would love to get a better one. Okay, um, all right, so anyway, uh, this does work. Now, let me tell you the limits of it. And, and I, I was warned of it. This works because we're working at small enough lambda to use the ultraviolet uh, point. We did this before we had this non-perturbative view of it, and now it becomes even more obvious that this has to be done by scale. As I, as I said, this lambda is dimensionless. So remember that in this case, uh, it has units of mass. So it means this lambda is A uh, times the renormalized lambda. And therefore, as A goes to zero, this parameter ought to go to zero. But we're not taking it to zero. We're taking it small enough that, we, that it's not getting a problem. But eventually, we could have problems because we're trying to take the limit to A. So in other words, the lattice spacing uh, extrapolations we're doing are not correct with this counter term. And I've been suspicious about this. And here's what happens. We, we, we've done more careful calculations. Uh, so it um, goes back to this. So here is, for example, um, this is the partial wave expansion in the cylinder. The one thing I want to show you is that we can get a lot of different exponents because it's really uh, easy to get exponents on a cylinder. These are, the, um, these are all of the even uh, uh, states. In particular, we have the uh, exponent for the energy atom tensor, which of course in the continuum should be exactly three because it's a conserved quantity. Uh, and then from that, this is back to one of our goals. From that, we can, um, uh, we can try to calculate the central charge because the central charge is related to the, um, the, the uh, sigma sigma T energy momentum tensor coupling constant by this formula. Now, there's bad news here. We can, we can get an estimate, but we actually, and here's our estimate. We don't really understand and we're getting a better hold on it. This estimate is done by a completely ad hoc statement that these points uh, should have no lattice spacing effects, but there are lattice spacing effects. We know that, we're trying to find them. If we, if we do that and we say, um, and, and you know, it's hard, look, this is an expanded scale, so it's not terrible data, but it's, it's honest. You have error bars. <clears throat> and if you do that, we get an estimate under the false statement that there's no lattice spacing things. We get an estimate is of well, this value. But the bootstrap, the conformal bootstrap, has an inequality that says it has to be greater than 0.94. Now, I don't you're, believe everything. Sounds like you're in three dimensions, are you? Yeah, there's three dimensions, yes. Okay. Now, I don't believe everything from the bootstrap, but I do believe that they understand the three-dimensional icing model and the gap, they, you know, the bootstrap is inequalities, right? It's not really solving a theory. I mean, in spite of its beautiful results. And, but the inequalities depend on knowing the number of operators as you go up in uh, conformal dimension. And of course they know the answer because a lot has been done in the three-dimensional IC model using Monte Carlo and so on and so on. So they know that their assumptions going into that inequalities are very solid, okay? And then they show that the free, that the bootstrap central charge relative to the free part should be greater than this. Now they have a, an, another assumption, which is very attractive. They think that that particular inequality is saturated. So they will uh, quote this as the central charge. But even if you don't believe that, in fact, we'd like to check whether their assumption of saturation is in fact correct, okay? It's, it's a certainly just an, 
it's it's as reckless as some of the statements that I'm making. I would can't claim, okay, okay, <laughs> even though it's a very beautiful method. I I do believe the inequality, and we violate the inequality if we make the naive assumption of no lattice space in anything. Now, clearly, there there are things like the Ricci term. It's very easy to think that there's some like square root of a, and it could go up to this value right now, right? So I mean, obviously, we have to be much more careful. It's a very hard calculation to do. Uh, but eventually, I think we can understand lattice spacing of effects. One thing that we're doing, which is a common thing to do, but we, we got, came to it only by um, kicking and screaming, we're solving the free theory on this geometry and studying the lattice dependence effects of the free theory. Now, the icing model is not the free theory, but actually the 3D icing model is not that strongly interacting. The, the um, uh, value of, of delta is a half in the free theory and very close. Uh, you can see if they're right, the central charge is very not very different from the free theory. So I think when we've studied lattice uh, spacing effects in the free theory, which we don't have to do by Monte Carlo, we could just do uh, matrix inverses, right? So we're in the process of trying to really understand lattice spacing effects. I think that's um, uh, one issue that'll, that'll help us. We can also um, tune the ultraviolet con um, counter terms and take the right uh, trajectory to the continuum limit, which is also changing lattice spacing things. So this is a work in progress. I think um, eventually we, we will get a hold of it. If we don't get agreement with this inequality, I claim we're just making a mistake, okay? I, I don't, I, I believe this inequality. I'm not gonna uh, argue with them on that. What we'd love to show is that it's accurate enough that we can test whether the, the, the saturation is correct, okay? And we haven't gotten there, and we're just not there yet. Um, statistically, it's not a big problem. It's, it's systematic errors that we have a problem with. Now, the other thing that we've been thinking about, which is some just very recent, so I tell you recent things, it turns out, that, you see, it's obvious that you can get the energy atom tensor by a four-point function because two sigmas go into the energy atom tensor and come back out. So it's a, it's a coupling constant. You can actually get it from finite temperature. And it's kind of amusing. Um, the other way to think about the cylinder uh, is not to put uh, antipodal points for one and two on each of these spheres, but to put one as an incoming state and, and the other as an outgoing state, okay? And this is a matrix element. But the other thing you can do, which is what uh, we're doing, is you can actually make this a finite temperature thing. You make periodic boundary conditions and you don't make it infinitely long. So what that means is that the trace of the finite energy thing brings in new states, okay? And so what you get is trace formulas like this. It's more or less obvious. Um, you can get, a, you can get a, a coupling constant. In other words, when you break up the trace, um, you, 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 you have um, two different states here and here as you go around the circle. So this is the circle. So one state can be here, then it flips its uh, Z2 odd to the other state. So in other words, this could be the energy momentum tensor propagating here, and then here it could be the sigma. And those turn into to terms in the uh, finite temperature um, cylinder, okay? So this is a two-point function, which can also find the same coupling. It's also true that um, Ami Katz and company, this is an, an old thing. You can actually get the central charge also by derivatives of the free energy. Actually, it's not, they have a new method for this. You can get the central charge by the derivatives of the free energy uh, on a cylinder. You can also get the central charge, by the way, by going to a sphere, okay? So there are many ways to get at the central charge. Now you would say, why don't I just construct the energy momentum tensor? It turns out that's very hard, even on a regular lattice, because it requires the concept of translations, okay? That's what the energy tensor is. So getting a good representation for the, that tensor is, is not, it, it, it's something worth doing, but you have to put in correction terms as well. So anyway, there's many routes to the central charge and eventually I think we'll, um, we'll get it. One of the advantages, by the way, of looking at finite temperature is you can actually see the flow of the central charge from the UV fixed point to the IR fixed point. So this is one of these zonological-like uh, issues of whether it's monotonic and so on. So there's a whole thing to do here at the finite temperature range, which is actually exploring a lot more 
details of how the central charge works. So I think it's an interesting problem to, to, to do. The other, so now I'm, now I'm into blue sky. What do we do next? Lots of things. Um, we can, uh, okay. As I mentioned, finite elements gives you all of the fields. This is just a, um, a slide that shows that I know how to write down the free uh, scalar field. This is the um, free uh, Dirac fermion uh, written down in finite elements. I, actually, I don't think this has ever been written down before. This is finite elements were really introduced beautifully by Chris, Chris T.D. Lee and Fernberg, but they did it all in flat space. If you do it in curved space, you have to introduce a lattice version of the spin connection. This is very much like a gauge field, except for it's a gauge field in the spin. <laughs> degrees of, for, the, for the manifold. So this is the correct formula for the Dirac equation. Um, this is the correct formula with all of these weights and dual weights. I won't explain them all, but they all come from this discrete exterior calculus uh, thing. That's the gauge field, non abelian gauge theory. This is FF dual. I'm just showing you can write down Lagrangians. That doesn't solve the problem. I hope you realize now. <laughs> it means that you've only gotten to first base. You have to figure out how to correct um, the ultraviolet. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a start. Um, uh, and by the way, I found this amusing. Since I started uh, becoming uh, more geometrically less naive, uh, I there was a I found this thing that Paul Dirac came to BU uh, with. Um, oh, what am I trying to say? Oh God. Uh, anyway, he came to Dirac when he was already retired in Florida. And it was a discussion with, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the English, um, English we just got the Nobel Prize. Anyway, uh, he came to discuss his view of doing physics and math. You know, Dirac was, uh, to me at least, famous for being very careful to only write down the right equations, never say anything wrong, very careful, and so on. Uh, but he, he uh, confessed that he actually thought a lot about geometry, okay? And he gave a talk in which there's a lecture, the lecture notes are, are recorded. Unfortunately, the person taking notes said, at this point, Dirac went to the board <laughs> and drew pictures. <laughs> and then he go on to the thing I can show you. And then at this point, Dirac went to the board and drew pictures and so on. And then, uh, uh, however, I found this picture of his notebook. So this is Dirac's notebook of the way he was thinking that he never confessed to the public, okay? <laughs> okay. And look what it's filled with. It's filled with projective geometry and simplices and so on, right? <laughs> so uh, we're in good co uh, company, even with Dirac, but apparently if we're as careful as Dirac, we never expose this to the public. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, look at this. This is from his notebook. Here's a tetrahedron. Here's these um, Pascal projections and this, whatever you call this theorem, the common uh, points, you know, uh, where you, you where you consider um, all conic sections to be the same, and you get these wonderful theorems and so on. <laughs> so, so not not only um, uh, does Hilbert uh, think that geometry and, and imagination is important, so does Dirac. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so anyway, aside from uh, one more comment, we are going to three dimensions, and there's a, and the interesting thing about three dimensions is that it's the sphere in two dimensions, as I said, was nice to have the icosahedron. Amazingly enough, the three dimensions is sort of the square of the icosahedron. So what it is is the following. It's a wonderful, what is the best platonic solid for the three sphere? That's the question, okay? And Aristotle said, it's a very interesting thing. Aristotle said that if I took regular tetrahedrons and now curvature is around an edge, right? Because you have you have hinges, right? He, Aristotle said, if I put five tetrahed regular tetrahedrons around an edge, they folded in flat space. He was wrong by 2%, okay? <laughs> it turns out that when you take five tetrahedrons, this is a really wonderful, and you fold it together, it's slightly positive curvature, just like five uh, uh, equilateral triangles is positive curvature, okay? Except for this is a tiny uh, defect. If you keep doing this 600 times, they fold around the sphere, S3. Now, 
the sphere S3 should have the symmetry O4, which you'll recognize is the Euclidean Lorentz group, right? Actually, I, I, I told, I, I told uh, Hugh Osborne that the, about the 600 cell and, that it, and I said it has 14,040 14, symmetries. And he, without blinking, said, yes, the largest subgroup, discrete subgroup of O4. <laughs> now, what happens is that this subgroup of O4 is really the product group of the left and right decomposition in SU2. So this is 120 times 120. Whose square is that? And the way to think about the uh, uh, 600 cell, there's many ways everybody thinks about it. If you take, okay, let, here, I'll explain to you the icosahedron and the 600 cell in the same language. I take the icosahedron and I go to a point, right? And it has a five-fold uh, vertex around that point. So that has five symmetries and inversion, which is 10. So the symmetries around a point is a tenfold symmetry. It's the rotation and the inversion. But there are 12 of those points. And so you can move those points to each other and 12 times 10 is 120. Okay? Now, if you take the 600 cell and you look at a point, uh, that point, uh, the dual of that point is an icosahedron. You know, just like, like the pentagon is the dodecahedron dual to the point on the on the on the icosahedron, right? So you look at the dual cell on the icosahedron. That's a that's the dodecahedron. So what I really did is the fivefold symmetry of the dodecahedron, which is the dual times ten. Okay. So it, you do the six hundred cell, and you look at the dual cell around a point, and you discover that that is the icosahedron with one hundred and twenty symmetries. And there are 120 such points. Okay, so it, it, in the dual language, the 600 cell is sort of the. In fact, sometimes this is called the I. I don't know. I cost a blah blah blah. blah. There's sort of various names for this thing. Okay, but the interesting thing is it's exactly the square. All of the geom, all of the algebra is the same, except for you have to square it. <laughs> okay. Now we have now done. Um, we have now put tetrahedron. Now there's another. There's one um, uh, uh, one one uh, problem. It turns out that you cannot refine the tetrahedron with uniform tetrahedrons, whereas the triangle could be refined with uniform triangles. There's always problems. Okay, you have to ref the the tetrahedron. You can think of a tetrahedron as the red. Uh, corners of a square. And then when you refine that, you end up making smaller tetrahedrons towards the corners, but then there's an octahedron. So actually, this is the way you uh, pile up oranges uh, in a grocery store if they ever allow have piles of oranges. Okay. Uh, but uh, so you have to actually have to have a tessellation alternating between regular tetrahedrons, and then you put a point inside the octahedron which is a, um, a right angle tetrahedron, but it's okay. You can keep doing that. It's a, it's a mixed lattice regularization, so you can keep refining it. Um, and, um, but, it, but the finite element people are, are afraid of right angles because if you looked at the um, formula in, um, even in 2D, when you went to a right angle, what happens is um, the circumcenter crawls outside of the triangle, right? And that means that a bond length on the edge of the triangle becomes negative. And there's all kinds of warning signs, Light, red lights go off and say, oh my God, things might be unstable, it's not gonna work and so on, it's false. We know that in two dimensions, it's the same as linear elements and linear elements are definitely positive definite. So you can prove that no matter how you triangulate, you never have minus signs in the actual spectrum of the operator. So I started to read analyze this for the tetrahedron. And it turns out that the tetrahedron is worse when the tetrahedron gets too misshaped, uh, circumcenters fall through the edges and so on. And the finite element people never told me how to write these things down. In fact, they said, oh, it's terrible. We have to avoid this. I don't know how to write down the Laplace operator when we have circumcenters that go outside. This is terrible. 
I just did mathematic and discovered that no matter what happens, unless it's extremely misshaped, the eigen the eigenstates are not the eigenstates on a given tetrahedron are all positive. Well, except for one, the zero, the zero mode is there. So you can easily show there's no problem with stability. The, the Laplacian works fine. You should just ignore uh, the the um, fear of the finite element <laughs> literature about this. It doesn't have any any problem at all. The question is how to write down the discrete exterior calculus when you have negative signs, because when the because the distance to the circumcenter when it goes outside the cell is a negative thing. So they 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 all scream, well, we don't know what happens, it's on. Here's the formula. Okay. Uh, so here is a here is a cell. Then what what's this is by the way shows you how basically street exterior calculus works. The nice thing about uh, circumcenter duals is the following. I take an edge, that's the one cell, and the middle of it is the circumcenter, right? Now, if I go perpendicularly into the face of a triangle, that's the circumcenter of the triangle. If I go perpendicular from the face into the center, that's the circumcenter of the tetrahedron. So what I'm doing is I'm building up the epsilon symbol. You know, the way you take a dual of a form is you apply epsilon symbol, but the epsilon symbol has i, j, k when they're unequal is, is zero and you need those, that sign convention. So this is the discrete version of the epsilon symbol. I mean, in a certain sense, this I think is the whole story of discrete exterior calculus, okay? You need an epsilon symbol. And the wonderful thing about circumcenter duals, not all duals, by the way, people use this in GR, is that everything is orthogonal. You're building an orthogonal dual system, okay? And now the question that happens, what happens when this circumcenter starts to crawl outside through a face? Yes, it's true that all kinds of minus signs come in, but there's only one analytic continuation, which is smooth. And here it is. The weight, th this formula, as far as I know, is, is nowhere in the literature, but uh, um, of course, as usual, I'll probably eventually have somebody as smart as my uh, convener of this thing that tells me he's already done it. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, so here is the weight of this edge due to the Laplacian's contribution inside that tetrahedron. You can do it always by cell by cell. You can add it up, it's an additive thing. So yes, here's the negative signs that people worried about on the triangle, they're there. But there's also negative signs when um, this um, H here, which, which is the distance inside changes sign. And what you need is you need to have the sign of the um, bariocentric coordinates. So these are the bariocentric coordinates. They have, when they're all positive, you're inside. When they're outside, they, they're negative. This is exactly the right sign convention. Everything is smooth. There's no problem uh, until the thing becomes extremely absurd. The spectrum, even cell by cell, is positive, OK? So the answer is that we now can do Laplace operators on the three cell. There's no problem. Um, and we're rapidly going to, we're, we're going to do the 3D icing model on a sphere which will be another way to get to the central charge. <laughs> you know, we have, we have this laser focus on trying to get the central charge. Uh, but it also means that we are set up in principle, kinematically, to do R cross S3, which is actually four-dimensional theories. And that's, you know, I'm a high energy physicist. I believe in four-dimensional space-time, right? So I, we have the kinematics of doing theories in R cross uh, S3, uh, R cross uh, so R cross S3. And so the kinematics is there, but that doesn't mean that you can get the flow to the fixed points with non-perturbative methods. And there, um, Lucer, uh, when I first mentioned this problem, it's very funny, I mentioned to him about five years ago. He said, Richard, okay, fine. I expect you to figure this out during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing he said, of course you want to adjust all the constants by using Wilson flow, <laughs> okay? I think he was wrong about the first one, <laughs> but probably right about the second one, and that there, there is some kind of way to renormalize the theory. But what we have to do is Wilson flow on every tangent plane. And I'm hoping is that what we know is the parameter space that we need to uh, modify is the affine parameters. So that's my um, 
my, you know, back to unrealistic optimism, that we understand the parameter space to be the affine space, and that we have to do some kind of renormalization point by point on the tangent plane, okay? And so um, uh, I can only be wrong about this, but um, uh, better to have a guess. So I, I think we're beginning to understand, you know, where the problem lies. And um, as far as I can see, the only way to do it is to do it one problem at a time and make sure that it actually works. So anyway, by the way, we're also doing hyperbolic space. So I want to, so anyway, I want to use this machine. We, I'm in the beginning of a five-year uh, SIDAC five thing with DOE, with very smart people, with very smart codes. And whenever I can find a way to put these codes into parallel, I'm going to get other people to put them on these machines. And uh, that goes back to the fact you realize that we really are limiting ourselves to semi-regular grids. The faces of the S2 are triangular uh, graphs. And the and the in the internal part of the tetrahedron are actually mapped into regular uh, cubic graphs with with different nearest neighbors, okay? But the data structure in both in both interior structures are completely regular graphs. So it's not crazy that that good parallel code could be done this way. Unfortunately, every single code that's been written for QCD assumes at the bottom of their their code base a regular hypercubic graph. And so I've got to get enough people to think about how to to you know raise the whole platform of lattice gaze theory and put a new foundation underneath. Okay, and and that's not something that software people love to hear. Okay. Uh, but it's not impossible. But I, so if we can get this to work in 4D, it's a big if. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. We've got to figure out how to renormalize four-dimensional theories. Okay, they're not they're they're not um, uh, super renormalizable. I think our perturbative counterterms, as as hard as they are to calculate, probably are okay for super renormalizable theories. Uh, but I, it's not going to work. I think for um, uh, asymptotic and free theories. So it's a really hard problem. And if you know any smart students or, or elder statesmen who want a hard problem, uh, they can join our, our discussion group every week. Um, I've got David Sage possibly thinking about doing supersymmetry on these spaces. So there are plenty of hard problems left to do. Uh, and uh, so I thank you for your patience. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. That's uh, fascinating. And um, I, I just have one. Uh, we have a very true one part. Uh, before yes, we have one person who managed to, to last last the whole time. Uh, yes, but I no. would like to please please make sure I get some of these references, which I clearly don't know the know about. Yeah. Yeah, Paul said he would send you some of those references. But yeah, I, yeah. The. Um, Thought is that analytically, I should be able to calculate improved lattice actions in curve space. Did you try? Well, I don't think. I think you're gonna. I think you're gonna have to have a numerical algorithm to do this. You see, I mean, imagine. I mean, think about. Suppose we want to do this for the three-dimensional IC model, which we'll try. Okay. Suppose we put the three-dimensional IC model on this field. Okay. Yes. I'm claiming that there is a six-parameter space. What I'm claiming is that. If I write a graph, it's a little complicated because of this mixed graph, but and I can discuss that. But basically, if I write a graph um, in flat space, which is translationally invariant, but is affine uh, transformation of, a, of a, a norm graph, that that will have six parameters. It will have six couplings. No, I, I understand. Yeah. What, what I, yeah. I should be able to feed it back in. in that you have an analytic expression for your Laplacian. Which is built no, but on your... the trouble is, I mean, in, in the finite element, the free case, I do have an analytic form because yes. finite element people have given to me, right? But now I can, well, I can, I can so, in the five four case, I can feed that back in because I've got a finite number of divergences. I should be able to feed that back in to the oh, yeah, in a super normalizable theory. No, that's right. Super normal, I start from the free theory. Actually, I don't even have to do anything. So, 
uh, you know, Fidel Almas has already told me how to undo this Afmine transformation. I mean, yes. in, in this in this way of thinking about it, finite elements has secretly understood that in the free theory, they're doing an affine transformation. And they've got a rule, which they call discrete exterior calculus, which actually restores the symmetry. Mm -hmm. So what we did is generalize that to the non-free IC model. And, and we realized that that space is that, that parameter space. Now, what you have to do the, the auxiliary calculation. So in the case of the 2D EIC model, we could find the analytic form, these cautious and so on, all this beautiful stuff. But what we can do is we can take flat space and do an affine transformation of flat space and find this function numerically yeah. as a function of the affine parameters. Then we go to curve space and calculate the affine parameter, which is easy. It's just the projection, OK? And we use this function that we've just calculated. Now, it's going to be a differentiable function. It's smooth. Um, and we got to get it to certain accuracy. But the accuracy, like all of these things, the accuracy is more and more as the lattice spacing goes to 0. So you only have to get it accurate enough so that that's not the leading problem, OK? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a setup thing you're going to, to run a computer to do these uh, experiments on what the impact is of this distortion, OK? And then you'll feed those in as constants in a table, functions in a table, and you'll run the code. Yeah, the, no, the, I, I see how the, the question is whether that space is that finite space. If it's, um, you know, in three dimensions, it's six parameters. It's a six parameter manifold a functional space as a function of the affine parameters. Now, we don't happen to have the exact solution to the three dimensional IC model. <laughs> I don't think yet. <laughs> no. So I can't calculate them analytically, mm -hmm. but I should be able to calculate them numerically. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's, it, it is sort of, well, okay. You know, we know that you see the scaling parameter. Okay, let me take it. Yeah, the scaling parameter is kind of like the relevant parameter of of the five four theory, right? The other parameters are these shape parameters, due to the um, fact that my space is not translationally invariant, but as I move along, the shape keeps changing. Mm -hmm. Those parameters were always um, ignored in in a regular lattice because the shape didn't change. Yeah. By the way, even the ice model, you know, on a on a on a rectangular lattice, you need two different couplings. You need a coupling going in time and space. And in fact, if you take the lattice spacing to zero, you get the so-called transverse quantum icing model. Mm -hmm. so yeah. This relationship of cautious was already known, I think, even by Ansar in that case. Okay. So all we've really done is generalize it to a three-parameter space instead of a two-parameter space. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess it might, you know, I mean, you, you have these formulas basically in your paper. So, so I mean, you know it from the modular uh, language form, right? Yes, I mean, it's, um, it's once you start getting to, uh, once you can, you can write it down very generally on, uh, in two dimensions on, uh, on, yeah. on and you have, and, but, but I, I guess the question I have for you is that um, we can do it another time, but I mean, you've done it for the free theory. So I would think you're going to get the finite element version of that. Well, I did it for the Ising model as well there. No, no, I know you did. It, oh, but it, I want it, to now it, go it, back to the It is essentially the free the finite element method because I started in essentially exactly the way you said. I took the continuum. The free theory was was taken by taking the functional and no, 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 no. I, I, I completely agree. No, I'm trying to do one other problem, which I think you've really done, which I didn't understand. OK, OK. There's two free theories. There's the fermion free theory in string theory, right? Yes. And there's a free boson theory. Yes. OK. The free boson theory, I claim, is the standard finite element method. Yes. OK. So you should see the modular parameters to be the finite element rule. Yes. In other words, we should see K i equals L star over L. 
Yeah, I, I, I believe you do. Yes, I believe you do. It's probably in your paper. I just have to dig it out. <laughs> I mean, it, we just didn't keep a, we just didn't bury them. We took a regular letter, so it's it's less obvious. Yeah, but you, but in the case of the icing model, you did take a general lattice. It was a general lattice again. Oh, it you took a general space. Yes. It's a modular parameter space. I mean, it's a general modular. Space. We did that for the uh, for both of them, but it's it's a regular so, lattice so, on, a, on, a on a skewed torus. So, so, so just as a uh, an academic exercise, it's probably more an academic. I'd like to see that your free case is finite elements. I can. I will check. I, it, it should be. It must, it must be. It must I, be. I believe it is. Yeah. I mean, it can't be. I, I know the solution in that language. It can't be two solutions. <laughs> So, so you see I want to let Brian in, in because he's, he's there. He's, I think he wants yeah. to ask a question. Oh, yeah. and, uh, Brian has been there. <laughs> no, no, I don't have any specific questions to ask him, Joe. Um, no, I enjoyed the talk. It was interesting. Um, um, okay. But I, you know, I don't work in this area, so I don't have any... Well, what is your, what is your area, Brian? It was quite what a field, but I don't, I don't do lattice. I don't do numerics. It's all I'm, I'm familiar it's with the Ritchie calculus for general relativity. Yeah, people were varying the bond lengths. They just wrote down the Einstein action in terms of these bond lengths. And, yeah, so um, let, me, let me let me just ask. Uh, um, Simon Catterall tells me that he's always afraid of knowing what the measure is if bond lengths are varied. Is is do you think that's a problem? The measure in what Simon state? doesn't vary the bond length. He varies the um, graph, you know, and, and assumes that in on average, uh, regular triangles can can be model on average a, 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 a given manifold, right? Mm -hmm. But he doesn't vary the bond lengths. You see, the reason for varying the bond lengths, of course, and both of you know this, is because now the curvature gets distributed around the whole surface, right? Yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. have defects. If mm -hmm. you keep um, if you keep regular triangles, you always have defects. And then if you use an ensemble average, which people want to do in Reggie calculus, you say an ensemble average becomes smooth. But see, that's not good enough for us because we have a frozen uh, background. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but look, I mean, again, the Reggie calc, I mean, I probably should look at it more because in terms of bond lengths, I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to find the geometric language for our manifold, that's basically. But again, I think that only gets us to first base. It gets us to the classical Lagrange. Yeah, I mean, I thought the Reggie calculus did the same thing. By varying the bond lengths, you're varying the metric. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. No, it, you, it you, is you, a simple you have a fixed bond lengths, you get a fixed background, and you're, you're doing quantum field theory on that background. Yeah. Perhaps I will yeah, stop the, way, the, the recording because we've degenerated into. A, kind of a discussion at this point yeah yeah i know absolutely and 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 people have been patient those people okay. for you hanging on i i congratulate you for sticking in there yeah. uh, but um thanks again richard i'm just stopping the recording at this point uh,